So we're in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Take a look at verses 1 and 2. Abraham was a witness to another land about who is the one true God. So look at verses 1 and 2 there. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from the land, your relatives and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So the purpose of a Christian mission, number one, is to make God known, to make God known. You know, through God's blessing, Abraham, of Abraham, the world would come to know God. In uh, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. Kind of an amazing thing, and it still happens today. The world noticed that God's hand was on Abraham. And the world will notice when God's hand's on you. Now, they won't recognize it as such, but they will know there's something different about you, and more importantly, something different about your God. Take a look at Genesis chapter uh, 13, if you will. Uh, take a look at Genesis chapter 13. We're going to take a, a look there uh, further about this call of Abraham because he was a man of character. He was a, a special person as everyone is called to the missions. And Abraham was an ambassador. And it says in verses 1, And Abraham went up from Egypt to Negrave, he and his wife, all that he had and lot with him. And Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. So our character and faith point people to God. Uh, and the world looks at us and they know, you know, in most cases, money is a disaster to Christians. You know, it distracts from the mission. It becomes our idol. We make it our idol. It can hurt our testimony. But in Abraham's case, he showed his integrity. And even though that he was loaded, uh, he never made what he possessed overshadow who he possessed. And in, in, in uh, chapter 13, in the latter part of verse 4, it says, And Abraham worshipped the Lord there. That was his main objective, to worship the Lord. Abraham's testimony was becoming well known to among the lost world. In Genesis 14, the uh, four kings team up to fight against some of the neighboring towns or cities uh, of Abraham, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And his nephew Lot lived in Sodom. So these four kings routed these two cities. They took all the possessions and the people, including Lot and his family. Well, when Abraham was made aware of this, he put together an army and he pursued the enemy and overtook them. And in Genesis 14 and 16, he said he brought back all the, all the goods and also his relative Lot and his goods and as well as the women and other, chill, other people. So a Abram uh, further showed his integrity here in chapter 14 in giving a tithe to uh, the priest there, the mysterious priest Melchizedek. He gave an offering to him, and he does something unusual as well. The king had offered him a bounty, which is very typical, and he refused that bounty. In verses 21 through 24 in, ver in chapter 14, it says, And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. And Abraham said to king, the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so that you can never say I made Abraham rich. So he had in tremendous integrity in his mission. In fact, he was saying to the world, whoever was listening, he was saying the, that there's a powerful God that's more powerful than any king on earth. His name is Yahweh. He is creator of all things. He's my sustainer. He's my supply. Not any man or king. He had tremendous integrity. So there are some elements of being a missionary, of being on mission. And the first is a call. We read about it with Abraham and his mission. These eight were called to their mission. There's another 12 that are called to Honduras. There was a team that spoke last week that were called to do mission in Africa and so many more. I'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, if you will. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to consider some things about this call, and the first is obedience. 
You know, have you ever considered the faith it took to, for Abraham to obey that particular call? Look at verses 8 through 10 in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to the place where he was going to receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that uh, has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Incredible testimony here. Abraham's decision to follow God, to obey the Lord, was a very difficult one. He had to leave the burial place of his father, very unusual for ancient uh, believers. He had to leave his family behind. He left anything familiar. He had to sever ties with the past. Uh, you know, he was called to live a nomadic lifestyle. I mean, I like camping as best as well as the next guy, but this was crazy. Just moving constantly. He was called to accept God's impossible plan for him. Well, there's elements of a mission. We talked about the call and obedience. There's also believing in God's power. You've got to believe in God's power. Abraham had faith and confidence in God's limitless power, the kind of power that Abraham knew would protect him in a hostile environment, would sustain him, even bless him during a famine. Abraham possessed a faith that really pleased God. Look at verse in uh, Hebrews 11, verse 11 and 12. It says, By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was barren, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past age, since she, cons she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. And therefore, from one man, in fact, one as good as dead, gave the offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as innumerable as the grains of sand in the seashore. So incredible promise here. Sarah was 90 years old when she had Isaac. She was not menopausal. She was post to post menopausal. I mean, this was crazy. And Abraham, no spring chicken at 100 years old. In fact, uh, Hebrews, we just read in verse 12, from one who was good as dead came offspring as numerous as the stars. So God's power is incredible. It's impossible, right? we got some medical professionals here. It's impossible, humanly speaking. But we're reminded by Jeremiah. He says, O oh Lord God, O oh Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth with your great power, with your outstretched arms. Nothing is impossible for you. So it takes that kind of faith to be a missionary. We are all missionaries. You know the little kid song we used to sing, Be a Missionary Every Day? Be a missionary every way, in a town, a country, or a busy avenue. No, anybody know this? Africa or Asia, the task is up to you. Never heard that? Oh, we're going to have to sing that. <laughs> we have a call. We have a call in our lives, Christians. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Acts remind us that we are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the entire world. Uh, the Acts continues to say, for this is what the Lord commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. You know, the first missionary, Abraham, uh, is incredible. He was called to make God famous. And that's exactly our calling. We have a calling to make God famous. Does the world know there's something different about you and your God? That's my question to you today. Uh, do we have, do we give the world a reason for the hope that is in us? Well, we definitely have a call. And we have been asked to be obedient to that call. Unfortunately, some have made obedience subjective or optional. You know, when you make something subjective, we tend to qualify it for its substance and its qualities and its attributes, you know. But there are consequences to making obedience optional. You know, in life, we can make obedience op optional on Main Street here and not pay attention to the speed limit. There can be issues with that. We can have a problem. You know, being a licensed driver in South Carolina, we have placed ourselves under the authority of the police. 
So it's either full obedience or, or face the consequences. In God's economy, uh, if we have placed our faith and trust in Christ as our Savior, we make him Lord in our life. By doing so, we willingly submit to Christ's authority in our life. So Jesus himself puts it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. As followers of Christ, our obedience flows from a heart of gratitude for the grace that we have received from Christ. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual worship. Our obedience shows our love for God. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And it adds this, And his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. So we also need to be, we have a call, we need to be obedient to that call. We need to have a living faith to believe God's power. Galatians chapter 3 says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him for righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God could justify the Gentiles by faith, and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed through you. As a person of faith, we are Abraham's sons. We carry the torch of faith that is handed down from believer to believer to share the good news. We, you and I, are ambassadors of God to the nations, sharing the message of redemption. You know, maybe... Uh, God's call seems impossible to you, an impossible task. You know, remember this, that his commands are not burdensome. He, if he calls, he will equip you for the task. You know, when um, the church is called to the same role as the Old Testament missionary, you know, whether we are sent to the far corners of Africa or we worship here in a local congregation in Clover, South Carolina, we are engaging as missionary witnesses to a watching world. The difference, though, is that Christ has already offered himself up uh, as a final and perfect and complete sacrifice. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we see the clearest and holiest of God. Uh, God is so holy that he, he would sacrifice his own son rather than have sin continue. God is, loves people so much, loves humanity so much, that he offered up his own son rather than demanding that we give our lives for sin. You know, the single most powerful missionary activity of the church is our worship. You know, God is not asking us to overthrow governments or hobnob with the, with the powerful or amass large amounts of money. But we worship God by doing what we were designed to do. That is being tools for his purpose. We worship God by proclaiming the good news of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to sinners who desperately need it. The missionary witness of Abraham and the missionary witness of the church are really the same. We worship God in spirit and truth. The only difference is Abraham looked forward to something he never saw with his own eyes. While we worship what we know, Christ crucified and resurrected. So I would imagine in a crowd this size today that there are some who are feeling separated from God. And the reason for that separation is sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death or separation, but the gift of God is eternal life. He desires, God desires to reconcile with you today. If you think about the word gospel, the G, God created us to be with him. He wants to have a relationship with you. All right. The O, our sins separate us from God. The S, sin cannot be removed by good deeds. By grace, we are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man would boast. P, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. The E, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. And the L, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Now, the Bible clearly states that 
faith and repentance are necessary to reconcile our relationship to God. You know, by faith, we believe that Jesus died for our sins. In repentance, we turn away from our sin and it leads us to righteousness. I'm going to pray in just a moment and give you an opportunity to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, it's not the prayer that is going to save you. It's Jesus that saves you. So let's pray together. Father, I love you and thank you, Lord, for this time that we can present these missionaries to you, Lord, these servants. I thank you, Lord, that you gave us an opportunity to go and share the love of Christ and the gospel in Nicaragua. I pray, Father, continuing that those here today would understand that the gospel is not just for the foreign country, for the third world countries. It's for them. It's offered to everyone here that if they would just trust you as Savior by faith, believe that you were raised from the dead, they can be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We pray that that would happen today, Lord. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.